Hello, this is Dangerous Minds, and I'm Richard Metzger. Joining me today is Nick Scowl, the author of a great new book about the brotherhood of eternal love, Orange Sunshine. Nick, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Great book. I was absolutely blown away by this book. I, I've said to so many people so many times that if somebody doesn't write a book about the brotherhood of eternal love, it's a story that's going to be lost when those guys died. And I thought the narrative was just incredible, and I'm hoping that, you know, we can reach some people who are also going to be, you know, like-minded travelers uh, who are going to want this story, and it's great to see you. Thank and, you. It's great. Um, great to be here. So let's start at the beginning, and who were the Brotherhood of Eternal Love, for people who don't know, and can you describe the milieu of Orange County, a place that we think of as a very conservative part of the country, at the time that would give birth to something like the Brotherhood? Well, the quick answer is that they were the so-called hippie mafia. They were made famous in a 1972 Rolling Stone article. The police called them the hippie mafia because they were the largest hashish smugglers and the biggest LSD distributors of the late 60s, early 70s. And um, in reality, they were a group of guys that were friends going back to high school in the late 50s, early 1960s in Anaheim. So you've got kind of a uh, car club culture, American graffiti era milieu going on at that time, and these were hoodlums, essentially. They uh, are the first to admit that. Uh, and they coalesced around a character named John Griggs, who was sort of a high school jock turned uh, street fighter. And they gradually became uh, so off kilter in their own personal lives that they were addicted to heroin and uh, committing petty crimes left and right. And the Brotherhood had its sort of first big uh, uh, you know, step forward, I guess you could say, psychically speaking, when they went up to Hollywood and at gunpoint ripped off some LSD, which was legal at the time, and I don't even think they realized that or had any idea what it was. But as soon as John Griggs and his friends took this stuff, they resolved never to use violence again. And you have to understand they continued, and at this point they already had smuggling trips down to Mexico, sort of surfing safaris and the like. And they continued with that activity, but all the hard drugs stopped. And they started tricking all their friends who were boozers and fighters to leave the bars of Anaheim and Garden Grove and go off into the woods or into the desert and they dosed these guys. And that's really how the Brotherhood was formed. Um, it was just a group of maybe a dozen, 20 people that you know, by 1965 roughly I would say had grown into hundreds of people uh, going out to Tockwitz Canyon in Riverside County. and. Um, to Mount Palomar and different places like that and just having these very highly ritualized LSD trips, which is how they sort of discovered Timothy Leary. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting, too, because, I mean, in 1965, you, you have a, a world and a culture that goes very rapidly from black and white into vivid technicolor right. and paisley and yeah. tie-dye. And, um, but Orange County is, was then and still is such a conservative part of California right. and America, and um, so how, how did these guys? I mean, like they must have stood out like sore thumbs in Orange County. How did how did they exist or coexist? I guess with the straight society at the time. Yeah, well, they uh, they fit into the extent that these guys were sort of you know, for example, a lot of them took to surfing in the early 1960s, and their hangouts were places like the Rendezvous Ballroom where Dick Dale and the Deltones used to perform the song Miserly. It was made very famous mm -hmm. in um, Pulp Fiction. In fact, one of the members of the Brotherhood was actually a drummer for Dick Dale. <laughs> and so these were popular guys. These were good-looking guys. They had, you know, great-looking girlfriends and families and were married. And so in some ways they were kind of, you know... Surf royalty. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Uh, and so, and, and Mike Henson, for example, is another early mm -hmm. sort of cohort of the Brotherhood. And, uh, uh, the thing is, is well, that let's see, who and Mike Henson was. Oh yeah, the, well, yeah, I should mention he yeah. was the blonde surfer in Endless Summer. Catches the perfect wave at the end of the movie. Right, I, an iconic yeah. surfer guy. Yeah. He ran into some tough times later on and never really talked about the Brotherhood, but finally did, and I was able to interview him. And he actually admitted that he had smuggled drugs with him during the filming of Endless Summer in his surfboard, and so he taught them how to actually, you know, carve little holes in surfboards, hide drugs in them, and wax them back together, and so forth. And this became their sort of preferred. Uh, technique of smuggling drugs at the beginning. Um, in, in the surfboards. In the surfboards, yeah. So the thing is, is that, you know, as they became more and more interested in LSD and more and more kind of cohesive as sort of a 
what they called a church, actually. Uh, you know, they, they registered as a church. They did. And in fact, that happened about a week after California banned LSD in October 1966. And that was just a, you know, two or three weeks after Leary gave the famous press conference where he told everyone to turn on, tune in, and drop out. So at this point, they had left Anaheim, Garden Grove, suburbia, and they had all moved into these houses up in the um, hills nearby in Majeska Canyon, which then and now is a very rural place and different than the rest of Orange County. I mean, you know, a lot of interesting kind of characters. And they sort of were able to pretty much hide out there. Mm -hmm. And more and more, uh, they started uh, having these amazing LSD sessions where someone would act as a guide and make sure that everybody was you know, feeling OK. But they were converting in a sort of evangelical way all these people away from what they viewed as sort of a sick, you know, conservative, uptight society into something that at that point still it was just in a, you know, very early stage. Uh, so they were like on the forefront of the psychedelic revolution that way. They were trying to put Leary's whole notion of dropping out into reality. Uh, and in fact, that's how they became to befriend Leary. They had a very specific plan of trying to lure him out to California from the East Coast, and ultimately they wanted to drop out on an island with them somewhere. They, they mm -hmm. had these very utopian ideas mm -hmm. they were pretty grandiose, but um, no, of course that never happened. Leary was never interested in dropping out of civilization, but he did have a lot of fun with the Brotherhood, and so he decided to stay with them. Mm -hmm. uh, they had moved from Majeska Canyon uh, at the beginning of 1967 down to Laguna Beach, where a lot of these guys were working as uh, sanitation workers, for example. and. Um, and they started settling in these little cheap houses in uh, Laguna Canyon. And that's where they really kind of established their sort of readout, uh, which John Griggs nicknamed Dodge City. And I, I have to say, having read the newspaper articles at that time, the local stories, uh, you know, not a week went by without some sort of major bust. It was a constant, mm -hmm. you know, cat and mouse game between these guys and the, the local cops. I, as you can only imagine. I mean, the, 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 I, mean I could just imagine that, you know, that the Orange County sheriffs and the police force must have been like all like former Marines, flat top type of guys who hated. Yeah, and they absolutely. Like then. They absolutely were. Yeah, it was funny because uh, the center of the Orange County psychedelic scene, probably the biggest psychedelic scene in Southern California, became Laguna Beach because of the Brotherhood. No one really understood what was going on. The cops one month were just arresting people for drunk driving, this and that, and then when the summer of love up in San Francisco kind of started to wind down. Uh, at the end of that summer is when uh, the Brotherhood opened this uh, head shop on Pacific Coast Highway, Mr. Mm -hmm. Gart's World. Mm -hmm. And all these refugees from Haight-Ashbury started heading south into Laguna, and the cops were just completely overwhelmed. Uh, they were arresting people uh, for smoking pot in public. Uh, Neil Purcell, uh, who was a former cop in um, at Newport Beach, had just arrived specifically with the intention of trying to go after all these hippies. So uh, mm -hmm. it became you know, a very, uh, uh, you know, intense kind of a situation. Uh, but what the cops really didn't understand was that all this street-level activity was being orchestrated by a group of people that were essentially hiding out in plain sight in Laguna Canyon, and who at that time weren't just distributing LSD, but they had actually traveled all the way to Kandahar, Afghanistan, and were bringing hash back to Laguna Beach in Volkswagen minibuses, Porsches, what have you. So what were they, they were actually just, just stuffing these cars just full of hash and then just exporting them as if they, that's, I guess, I, I guess at that time there probably, customs 